Hey guys, TJ Sports here with another video from my shop. I've got the 1100MX right here. I'm loving this thing. It's a CNC mill. Some of you guys may have seen some of the stuff I've done with it on my social media. You'll be seeing more for sure on this YouTube channel of me using it. For today's video though, I'm doing a little uh, improvement and a little tweak. So the spindle itself has a power draw bar on it because it has the automatic tool changer and such. And so the power draw bar has been giving me some sticking issues. Now, this is just like a fine tuning and adjustment issue with the machine. It's, I wouldn't call it like a quality or design issue. Every machine has adjustments on this particular setup. I'm gonna walk you through that. I've read the user manual, I've watched some other videos. This is just how I approached it. I hope you enjoy. So I'm standing here in front of my 1100MX to Tormach CNC mill, and I'm gonna to explain to you the problems I've been having that I'm gonna tweak in today. So this is a BT32 holder. This is what the Tormach 1100MX uses to actually hold the tools. Now, you can see there's what's called a pull stud that sticks out of the top. There's an assembly inside the spindle that pulls on the stud and engages this tapered cone into a tapered pocket in the spindle itself. That engagement is what allows the tool to be spun and be accurately centered. Now, when that, uh, when that stud needs to be released for like a tool change to occur there's an air cylinder that I'm about to show you that when it compresses a set of sprung washers it basically disengages a set of almost like a claw system that releases that pull stud and allows the tool to drop out so when the air pressure is activated you put the tool in and then when the air pressure is released the claws pull up on the stud now if the stroke of the cylinder isn't correctly set up you'll end up with issues where maybe when the, the air pressure is activated and the tool is supposed to be falling out, there's still a little bit of a snag. And that's what I've been dealing with is like this small snag when you're trying to take the tool out of the spindle and it'll come out, but when the tool change is doing a tool change, it just makes a pop sound. I'm gonna show you manually what it looks like when that happens. So I'm gonna activate the air pressure. So the claws are open, put the tool in, let go. So the claws are now holding that stud up. When I press on the button, this, in a perfect world, this is supposed to just fall out completely free. As you can see, it fell most of the way out, but it's snagged. And it does come out, but you don't want that in a tool change operation where this system is trying to draw this out. You don't want any popping like that because it puts a lot of stress on the system. I'm gonna tune that, and I'm gonna try to get that to where it just falls right out nice and clean. So up above the spindle, I've got the cover open. You can see there's a lid that's open right there. You can see exactly how it functions. So right here you've got pulleys. The belt is on the smaller pulley because that means it's in a higher RPM gear ratio. For more torque, I can move the, the pulley down here. That's what actually spins the spindle. So when I spin that pulley, you can see it spinning. Obviously you can see the electric motor back there that turns the spindle. Now through the center of the spindle is the uh, power draw bar. Well, the draw bar itself is this right here. And you can see these are those compressible spring washers. Those washers are domed so that when you push down on the draw bar, those compress, opening those forks, which grab the pull stud. When it decompresses, it pulls it up. Up above here, you've got the cylinder housing. This is the air cylinder that actually drives downward and compresses all these springs. This power draw bar assembly is where the adjustment needs to happen. So you may have noticed it wobbling and thought, wow, why does it do that, right? That's kind of strange. Now, the interesting thing here is the design is such that the entire power draw bar assembly does not touch the power, the draw bar itself at all until the actual comp compression stroke begins. The reason for that being is when that pulley is spinning, you can imagine that whole bar spinning at 10,000 RPM, which is the max RPM of this machine. So there can't be any contact top or bottom. So this is actually free floating such that it's hovering above and below. Now, as soon as the compression stroke begins, and I'm gonna do it right now, it not only pushes down from the top, but you can see at the bottom, this plate, it draws upwards as well. So the top comes down and the bottom comes up. Now, as you'd imagine, if this gap at the bottom is too much and this gap at the top between there is too much and this is already loose it's not supposed to be loose i loosened it earlier um, but if those gaps in combination add up to too much then too much of that piston stroke is taken up before the compression actually begins 
and thus you don't get enough of a compression to actually fully release the tool effectively. So there's a couple ways to change this. Obviously up here we can spin this bolt and we can tighten that gap. We actually already have a pretty tight gap. But one thing I'm noticing is there's a pretty large gap here, kind of unnecessarily large. And the overall stroke, as you can see, is really not much. I mean, maybe, I don't know, not even five eighths of an inch. And so, you know, an, a sixteenth of an inch difference is, is kind of a large percentage of that stroke that's actually not being used to full effect. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull this, there's two pins that actually hold this in place. There's this guy that literally is just a uh, ball detented pull stud and this whole thing pivots around this guy, which is a spring-loaded uh, shoulder bolt that holds this thing down. So you can see I can actually move this whole power draw bar assembly around. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put washers under these feet so this whole plate sits a little bit higher and I'll show you uh, how that works. All right, I've put washer spacers under each of those two corners. As you can see, that actually opened our gap up up here. And so by spinning this, I can close that gap even more. So again, we've tightened this whole package to have better compression going on. And the benefit, hopefully, is smoother tool changes. Let me give this a try and see what happens. Here we go. Not quite there. As you can see, our adjustment didn't quite do it for us. Interesting. I'm going to mess around with this a little bit more. It looks like there might be a little more complexity than I originally thought. So after running this thing through a few cycles, I think it's actually going to work pretty good. I think I got it dialed in within spec. I, I do think though, reading the user manual, what might also be happening that's kind of adding to the problems is I think some of these parts are running kind of dry. Now the manual calls out using anti-seize on that pull stud itself uh, and use the pull stud covered in anti-seize and then put up in there to put uh, a bunch of anti-seize on those forks themselves be a little hard to get at them or to take it apart and get at them to put it on just directly. So that's what I'm going to do. And also I'm going to add some penetrating oil and uh, some grease to this setup up here. I think there's a little bit of binding going on just because of the dryness of it. But right now it's actually running perfectly smooth. So this is just going to be extra insurance. So I'm going to load this pull stud up with a bunch of anti-seize, but I've got to mix it up. The only kind the store had was like a two-part anti-seize, so I'm just going to mix some up real quick, slather it on there, and we'll see how this goes. Just going to mix her up really good here. Looking for that kind of standard gray finish that anti-seize usually is. All right. Well, getting there. Load this guy up. I want a, a lot on here because I want to really get into all the nooks and crevices of those forks and get tons of it going on there. Okay, I'm just going to sit this in there. Let's do it a few times. Maybe turn it. I want as much of that anti-seize up in there as I can get it. It's really hard to get at, so doing it this way I think is the best system. All right, let's see how easily it drops out right now. Perfect, that's what we're looking for. Now we're not gonna have this much anti-seize on all the pull studs. Hopefully there's enough that's actually deposited inside there that it's gonna work out for all the tools. Sweet. Guys, just kidding. I did not just put JB Weld inside my machine. <laughs> I used anti-seize. <laughs> so let's see how this goes. Tool change activated.
Perfect. So I didn't hear any popping, any clicking when that spindle rises up and clears the pull stud. I didn't hear any clicking. I'm going to do it one more time. Well, guys, I think she's fixed. It's running really smooth. Sounds really good. I'm excited. I'm going to run some handle parts here pretty quick. There's going to be another YouTube video coming of that. I want to do some cool milled patterns on these existing handles that I've been doing. And uh, yeah, make sure you don't put JB Weld on anything that you don't want to stick together. That was a joke. Hope you guys get that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, have a good one. Thanks for watching.